In an era where the word post-truth is just a pseudonym for outright lies, we must be vigilant in seeking out the real truth or face the dire consequences. My guest, Dr. Daniel Levitin, the world-renowned neuroscientist and cognitive psychologist, is on a mission to see we do just that. With his book, Weaponized Lies, he gives us the ammunition to think critically and never be fooled again. <music> Professor Levitin, let me just say welcome to the show, but more importantly even, before I give you an official welcome, never has a book come out so timely as this that I've had on my show. This is amazing timing for this book, so Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Barry. It's my pleasure. And we have to talk about this because weaponized lies and the, and the subheading, how to think critically in this post-truth. In fact, you want to make sure we even stop using the word post-truth. Let's call it what it is. It's lies. Right. And you're, you wrote literally a book to help us defend against all of the lies and most people will be amazed when they hear some of them they're going to swear it's the truth and know that with critical thinking it's not i'm a i'm a big believer in education i've devoted the last 30 years of my life to it i think education works the nice thing about it is that it doesn't favor people from one socioeconomic background or another it doesn't favor somebody from one end of the iq spectrum or another uh, and I think all of us need to be educated in uh, how to think critically. And I think that that's critical right now. Well, you even say in the beginning of the book, misinformation and lies have been around since the beginning of time. And I, I used to joke with people, if you, if you actually even saw the first presidential comments, this is after Washington with, with Jefferson, the way they threw things around was, was disgusting, actually, and lies all the time. The problem, though, as you say now, and I'll quote it exactly, the unique problem we face today is that misinformation has proliferated, literally, in fact, the entire society, and it does so in a second. The nanosecond that it takes to tweet, to Facebook, to post, to do anything now doesn't give a person a chance to even digest the truth. I think that's part of the problem, and we are living in an age of information overload. We've created more information in the last five years than in all of human history before it. And so I think it's no wonder so many of us feel stressed out, we feel inundated and overwhelmed. We see something on Facebook and we don't know how to figure out whether it's true or not. It seems like it might be true, so we put the little thumbs up or we forward it or repost it. And then we become part of the problem. We become part of the avalanche of things that are being clicked on and, and forwarded in just a second, a nanosecond, as you say, uh, to the detriment of the truth. But we used to live in a time, and as I say, this sounds almost like nostalgic glory, and it never was. I'm going to level with you. As you have said before, this has been going on since the beginning of time. But with the proliferation, the difficulty is how does the average citizen, and that's what you address in the book, you show them how they must be able to decipher this because you pick up the paper and at least you'd have certain things that you could call were facts. Now you can't even pick up the paper anymore because they are leaned and biased in certain directions. So you have to really glean a lot of information. You show us how to do it, but time still is difficult for the average citizen to find. Well, I, I wrote this book because my aim is to empower the average person over the age of 13 or so to figure out for themselves whether the things they encounter are true or not. There's been this balkanization of the news media that you're alluding to. Uh, I, think, I think back to my childhood, uh, my teenage years, my 20s, if you encountered the proverbial man or woman in the street, and at a bus stop, and you just start talking about the news, you pretty much could rely on the fact that you had gotten your news from one of the same handful of sources, and you would agree on what the facts were. 
you might not agree on how to interpret them or what should be done about them. You might disagree about whether the economy should be stimulated in this way or in this way. But the bedrock on which the discussion took place was fixed and agreed upon. That's no longer true. Uh, and that's causing a kind of uh, disconnect between one half of the country and the other. It's, causing, it's been causing for the last several years a paralysis in public policy makers. Uh, and uh, look, I, I think that facts matter. If, 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 you, if you're going to build roads, if, if you're trying to pass through a bill to appropriate money for roads, you ought to be able to have facts that everybody agrees on about where the roads are needed so that you don't spend the money foolishly when they're, where they're not needed. And we have to, I think, have better role models than we do uh, who believe in facts and who believe in information and talk about that before they, they talk about anything else. And we have to, as you say, take on this responsibility because if we're waiting for those better people to just march up and run for election, we are going to be waiting till the end of time. So it is. Which may come sooner than we think. <laughs> well, let's hope not. <laughs> but it is our responsibility. And, and, and critical thinking, you're very, you're careful to say that doesn't mean that you disparage everything you read. It doesn't mean that you just don't believe anything. It means that, quote unquote, as you're subheading in the book, you critically think about it. And I find that almost most critical thinking, if you just even use the slightest bit of common sense, that would be enough. The problem is we're not even using our common sense to deduce whether something is true or not. Well, I agree with you. And you said a moment ago that people feel that they don't have the time to, to engage in critical thinking. And by the way, I, I like the term evidence-based thinking also. Critical thinking has a little bit of baggage uh, in that it feels kind of old and old-fashioned and stuffy. But evidence-based decision-making, which I think is the same thing, is what I promote. And I think that you know, most claims we can evaluate in 40 seconds or so. Ask yourself, take Brexit for an example. Uh, there was this lie, I don't want to call it fake news, but there was this lie going around that uh, British citizens were losing 350 million pounds a week by being members of the EU, money that could better be put into the National Health Service. And I was in England a few weeks ago, and a guy said to me, how, how do I know when I hear this that it's not true? And I said, well, where did you hear it? He said, oh, everybody heard it. There were buses driving around England, and it was written on the sides of buses. And I said, did you hear about it anywhere else? He said, no. He said, well, that might tell you something. <laughs> if the only source is that it's written on the side of a bus, oh may not be true. And he said, why? I said, well, if for no other reason some journalist is going to want to win a Pulitzer Prize or something to break the story, and they're going to write about it in the mainstream media. Well, that's, in fact, you just said it was on the side of a bus. You give an example where not only was it in the mainstream media, but on the ride to work the other day, I heard the exact same misinformation that you brought in the book. And I want to say what it was, and I want you to share this. It was that when California started to liberalize the marijuana laws, and you were no longer uh, being uh, arrested for at least a small amount of possession, the statistic, I'll never forget, and we, I just shared it with my family, the statistic was that 30, go give it to, do you know it exactly? I do, yes. Just, then take over. I, I like the way you're structuring this conversation because you're allowing us to walk through the steps, the, you know, the six or seven steps I think everybody should follow. So the, the first one is, does it come from a reliable source or the side of a bus uh, or just some crank website that you've never heard of? The second one is plausibility. Is the claim plausible? And so you have to work a little bit at some of these. The claim was uh, by the anti-marijuana, and this is not a political issue. I'm not taking sides. Uh, I try in the book to borrow examples from both sides. You do that perfectly. By the way, I want to let everybody know this isn't. This is critical thinking. It right. is not biased. In fact, it's the opposite. So, I, I think okay, I think it I, is. I, I, I plucked examples from both sides of the political spectrum. But in this particular one, the anti-marijuana folks said that in the 35 years since California stopped enforcing marijuana laws, 
the number of marijuana smokers in the state has doubled every year. Now, if you don't think about this, you might say, oh, well, that's, that's a lot of marijuana smokers. But what I say is pull out a napkin, back of an envelope, and let's just work this through. And in order to do these things, you sometimes have to make a simple assumption. So I'm going to make the assumption that 35 years ago, in the entire state of California, there was only one marijuana smoker. <laughs> yes, and we probably know him. <laughs> right, well, I mean, just between you and me, 35 years ago, there was probably more than one in this building. But let's just say in the whole state, right. there were, I'm looking at the cameraman there. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. Let's just say there was one, and let's double that number every year for 35 years. Well, if you do that, you end up with a number around 17 billion. That's more than the population of the planet. By threefold almost. Right. So it's not a plausible claim. You can dispense with that outright. And there are a lot of these things that you can dispense with very quickly. A cab driver said to me recently that he, he heard there were 15 billion people in the world who lacked Internet. I, I don't know exactly what the population of the world is. I Googled it. It came up somewhere, I'm seven, seven and a half billion. There can't be 15 billion without internet, not plausible. So you can very quickly work through some of these things oh. with, as you say, common sense. Two areas that you uh, really have a concern that we, we deal with, and that is the mishandlings of statistics and graphics, and the second, faulty arguments. Those are the two things. And of course, the statistics and graphics, because we're naturally, I don't know why as a species, we're a bit afraid, as you say, of mathematics. One of the things you do in the book, by the way, is you actually even show us how to quickly become a, somewhat of a statistician. I don't mean that we, we could be experts by it, but you do show us how to figure these things out in the book. And the statistics and graphs, as I told you, I never paid much attention to them. You look at the curve, you see it goes up. As I told you, I recently canceled a guest from coming on the show because he did exactly in the book what you tell us to avoid, and there's so many ways to manipulate those graphs. It could look like a change is occurring almost every day, like we said before with that marijuana smoker, but the reality of it is it may be so minuscule it may have no effect on anyone. There are a lot of tricks that people use uh, either because they're trying to manipulate you or they're trying to separate you from your money or they're trying to get you to vote against your own interests. Uh, and these are somewhat sophisticated, uh, I'm sorry, somewhat unsophisticated tricks that are easy to see through once you know what to look for. And the implications on so many levels, two of them in particular I want to deal with today is the implications of it in our judicial and legal system because you show how so many times experts come on to a panel they come in with a fact that is not a fact but makes sense because again it's they can show it on a graph or they can plot it out and even in our medical profession you make it so clear the the the, the exact example you use is the false positive, the results. And you say it's not only the patient who can be messed up by this, but even the doctors. If you're a woman and you've got no particular risk factors, you no family history of breast cancer, uh, no other uh, things that would make you think you're susceptible, but you go in for a, a breast cancer exam and the test comes back positive, you rightly would wonder, do I have it or not? Uh, and the physician may tell you, well, the test is 95% accurate. So you're thinking, well, that must mean I have a 95% chance that, of having the disease. But no, that's not what it means. It means that among the small number of women who have breast cancer, the test will detect it 95% of the time. But fortunately, breast cancer is relatively rare. It's very unlikely that the average woman off the street has it, even if the test says yes. Uh, because you're testing a whole bunch of people who don't have it. Uh, if you work out the statistics for one of the commonly given breast cancer tests, it turns out even with a positive result, you have less than a 10% chance that you have the disease. Unfortunately, doctors don't always understand this, nor do patients. 
and it led one doctor to perform 95 unnecessary mastectomies, removals of, of healthy breast tissue, before he was stopped because he mistook the diagnosticity of the test among this small population with the population at large. But you even in the book say determining the truthfulness of, or accuracy of a source is also not always possible. And, and in fact, one of the examples I, I know you even give in, in the professional peer reviews, there's now reviews that are peer to be peer reviews, but you're really paying for it. Yeah, this has been a problem in scientific and medical research, Barry, that there are these predatory journals that are not really peer-reviewed. And if I could back up and just say a moment what peer review is, if I do a study in my experiment, I have to submit it to a journal that is rigorous in its acceptance policy. They will engage three other scientists or medical researchers to look over the details of my methods to look over the data if they want to, the conclusions that I, I've drawn. And they have to be three people that I'm not friends with. We're not beer drinking buddies. We weren't students together. We don't have a connection. Uh, and they have to authorize, they have to approve this paper as meeting scientific standards. Then it gets published. But what's corrupted this are these predatory open access journals that do just hang, you know, like for-profit universities, they hang out a name that sounds fancy, like the International Journal of Medical Oncology. I'm just making that up, and if that's a real and a good journal, I apologize. It just came to my, came to my head. Caveat. Uh, you, and the public doesn't always know what the peer-reviewed journals are, but the scientists know. And I think you know, we scientists need to do a better job of coming on TV programs like yours, talking to the media and saying, no, that, that study's no good. This study is good. But you know, you mentioned our, our, our faith in one of the institutions, and, and that is the journalist Free Press. And both of us, you wrote a book that makes you part of the media. I'm part of the media. But the problem with the media, let's let alone certain biases that may exist, even taking that away, people dramatically, these are your words, overweight the relative risk of things that receive media attention. I find that this inducement of fear that comes out of that and how we then conduct our lives because of that, you know, you talk about lying weasels, that goes beyond, that is sinful. Is it, and isn't it fascinating? It was one of my teachers, Paul Slovic, who started this line of work in the 1970s, uh, where he showed that people base their assessment of risk on the number of headlines they read about something. So if you ask people, how, how often do, does somebody die by drowning or by, by being you know, hit by lightning, versus how often do people die from, say, stomach cancer, the fact is, I've never seen a front page story about somebody dying of stomach cancer, but I've seen plenty of front page stories about somebody drowning or somebody being hit by lightning. It's such a dramatic event that it gets press, but in fact, it's a very small number of people die in those ways compared to the number of people who die by stomach cancer. And this, the danger here, I wouldn't say the press are lying weasels, but they go, sometimes they go for the spectacular as opposed to the real, uh, or the quotidian, the day-to-day, the, -day. the danger here manifested itself right after 9-11. 9-11 um, was a terrible tragedy, you know, the, and the loss of life associated with it in the airplanes that were hijacked and in the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and so on. Uh, but people stopped flying by air during the three months following September 11 People who otherwise would have flown started driving. And the total number of deaths in this country rose precipitously. It rose you know, by a large amount because, in fact, uh, highway driving is far more dangerous than flying in an airplane. Air, air, air travel is one of the, the safest, even with the, the deaths uh, associated with 9-11. So it was the 
it was a misassessment of risk that, that caused a lot of people to die needlessly. And then what you use this term, belief perseverance. So that enters our mind. We now believe that it is way more dangerous to fly, and yet this is what's happening. So this is, again, where if we're not, it, we can't, we have to be even careful to allow our own beliefs to get in the way unless what we're believing is based on fact. Well, so yes, here's the thing. Uh, the, the human brain has a number of uh, problems in, in thinking rationally, it, uh, and we can overcome them. And one of them is this belief perseverance. Once an idea gets in your head and it takes hold, it's very difficult to unseat it, even if new information comes along that contradicts it or, or you know, makes it clear that it's not true. We have to fight that tendency. I, I believe that evidence-based decision-making means that you keep your emotions at bay long enough to allow the evidence to come in. You weigh the evidence. But decision-making means that you don't just make up your mind once and then stick with it. Uh, there's a fancy name for this in uh, science. It's called Bayesian inferencing, from the Reverend Bayes, who was a philosopher and, uh, and religious leader, uh, Thomas Bayes. Uh, but you don't need the fancy name. The simple way to describe it is you, you keep an open mind. As new information comes in, you're willing to change your mind if that information uh, turns out to be uh, to, to justify a change of mind. I think something also crucial, and I, I know we're probably over time, but I, I, I need to, to get this in, is you say... Well, you can edit. I, yes, <laughs> I, I, I will, exactly. Uh, you can think critically even when the decision is emotional. And I put down, that may be the absolute most important time, yet we know we're emotional beings. Our emotions take over, and sometimes we are at that moment, but you must at that moment give yourself that pause to think, even if it's not, like you said, critically, evidence-based, because you want to be careful. You don't want to be critical of necessarily what you're thinking, but you want to be certain that you're thinking properly. And yeah. even at an emotional level, I think that may be when it most importantly must take effect. The fact is for important things like medical care, um, how to uh, deal with a difficult marriage or relationship, where to invest your money, uh, taking a rational and slow approach is in so many cases better. There's a story going around now just this week about an Anaheim off-duty police officer who got into a confrontation with some teenagers because they were walking across his lawn, and he fired his weapon. And this was all captured on cell phone video, and it's, it seems to me that he allowed his emotions to get the better of him in this situation rather than thinking calmly about it. And isn't that the case with so much of the gun violence that we're seeing in the country right now? Um, I think that emotions are great. I'm the last per I'm trained as a, as a cognitive psychologist. I, I'm the last person to say emotions are bad. And, and I'm a musician, an artist. I, emotions bring us great joy, and uh, they connect us to um, life in a very intimate way and to the, the people around us. But when you have a decision to make, I'd say keep them at bay until you've made your decision, and then let your emotions help motivate you to be outraged or enthused, or to get something done. Doc, our time is up. I'm, I, there's so much more. You know, we're, we're going to start initiating a, a podcast. I may want to invite you on that podcast to go through so much, but right now our time is up, and, and I want to end with your words, though, still. Critical thinking is not something you do once with an issue and then drop it. It is an active and ongoing process, and I thank you, Professor, for making us aware of that process. Thanks for having me, Barry. It is my pleasure, and thank you all for joining us. Now, before Dr. Levitin leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Weaponized Lies. We, each of us, need to think critically and carefully 
about the numbers and words we encounter if we want to be successful at work, at play, and in making the most of our lives. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between all the numbers and words we encounter, there is truth. Think critically and you will find it, and you will then make the most of your life. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you, Barry. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Sam Ash Music, a proud sponsor of Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. Sam Ash has been serving musicians since 1924. To unlock your inner musician, information is available at samash.com. Thank you.